I am standing up for the forests, for Tekina, for a safer planet. And if that makes me a dangerous criminal, then I think we are going to need bigger prisons. This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Hoon. <laughs> Have you ever done a, a burnout? Never done a burnout. How about a, a donut? In Warrnambool, in my hometown, people used to do laps up down the main street. Yeah, we used to call it dupes. Dupes? What does that mean? When you would go up and down the main street. But that wasn't really hooning. That was just driving up and down Johnson Street going, oh, that's that's Bazo. That's that's dupes. That's so-and-so. Why are they called dupes? Oh, everyone has nicknames in Byron when I was growing up. Everyone has names like that. Baz, Boz. Does. But, but the act of doing the laugh is oh, called Oh, why is it called dupes? I don't yeah. know. I'm not sure. It's just doing a dupe. <laughs> Let's do a dupe up Johnson Street. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dupe it. Did you ever have, have, have any MPs who partook in, uh, in duping? <laughs> no, no duping. I've never seen an, an, an MP, um, you know, wholeheartedly endorsing hooning until <laughs> last weekend when it seems like we got a full-throated endorsement from, was it? Was it from um, Nick, Nick DeMeadow, Catter MP? I don't know all the names of Catter MPs in Queensland, for God's sake. It sakes. must have been, yeah, Nick DeMeadow. Nick DeMeadow, famously, if anyone um, is interested, if it, I'm pretty sure it was Nick DeMeadow who posted this video or shared a video, right, of hooning in his electorate. It's like filmed out the window. And, Tim, in a, a further political news, a Queensland, another Queensland MP has posted a something online, a video that's raising a few eyebrows. Yeah, definitely. I've been texted this video by plenty of MPs in, over the last hour. Uh, it, it shows a, a car hooning in a street in Ingham. It is the uh, seat of Cutter Party MP Nick Dometo. He posted this video to his social media about an hour and a half ago. It was quickly deleted. I just got off the phone to him. He says it was not him in the vehicle. He says he found the, the video online and reposted it as a Friday funny, uh, but he's since taken it down because it is distasteful. Uh, that video, it is in his electorate, but he says it was not him behind the wheel. Certainly a lot of people in the in Parliament House talking about that video and whether there could be further consequences for mm-hmm. someone because of it. All right. Yes. So he, he posted it to social media from his car, but he claims that he was not the hooting driver. But is driver. it his car? Is it his car? I thought, like, I thought in respect he then, because obviously he posts, this is one of the biggest, you know, Queensland politicians being like, crime is bad, yes. crime's awful, not Great. the little kid hoons, and then shares this video out of the car window, <laughs> clearly like doing burn and just hooning around and everyone's like hey what's the go here and then he was like oh I just shared it because I thought it was funny it's not me I thought he was saying he just found this video or came across it somehow and decided to share it <laughs> interesting content yeah yeah posting I just videos thought this was- does not endorse the actions it seen in this hoon video of use to my lecture did he post it on his official MP account I think so, and I think it was quickly deleted afterwards. He's yes. a classic. What I was going to say is Nick DeMeadow um, is, like, extremely buff. He used to be a bodybuilder, right? And if you go to his Instagram that he just uses as an MP now, yes, um, he's just got all these, like, shirtless photos <laughs> of him just with his six-pack out. Um, you know, I guess if you've got it flaunted, I'm sure it's not hurting the votes. Who knows? That sort of works. Nick DeMeadow. Posting video to his own social media, and then quickly deleted it. This is, I'm just watching back the video now. Quickly so, deleted it. That's that's a that's a shame. I think own your hoon. That's I've always said that. If you're gonna hoon, then own your hoon. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, I mean, it reminded me of, I think, last year, the Queensland government, because they've done a couple of rounds of, quote, unquote, cracking down on hooning in Queensland. They've passed new laws. Um, but I think it was it was either the transport minister or the police minister shared this video of a gender reveal um, hooning incident, which is extremely cringe, but they've got, like, the tyres that, that go blue or pink smoke. Right, gender reveal. It's a boy. Anyway, yeah. um, and he's, like, posted that. It was like this like sick soundtrack and then it cuts to the car <laughs> getting so they're like okay if you tear up our roads we'll tear up your car they got up this car that had been involved in this gender reveal hooning incident took it out the front of queensland parliament you're in parliament you're like wait what are they doing out there they set up this car right out the front of the gates and then brought in the big emergency like the big equipment 
to chop up this car and destroy this car <laughs> in front of Queensland Parliament, which is the most epic like Queensland politics thing ever. <laughs> it just makes it look so sick. And you're like, wait, what's happening again? I don't know, but it's fun. Fuck, that's good. Now, what a dilemma though for for uh, for conservative Australia. Endorsed mm. being against hooning. But also wanting to reiterate that there are only two genders. I mean, that's that's a real <laughs> choice. It's really confusing. Matt <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that funny, that bunch of idiots. What's that old adage, uh, Andrew? If it wasn't for double standards, the left wouldn't have any standards at all. The contempt towards average Australians. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. A serious danger to Australia. Well, who on? Brave souls. This is the Serious Danger <laughs> podcast about green politics in Australia. It's not an official Greens Party podcast. Please stop asking. It's made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. I'm Tom Ballard. I'm Emerald Moon. Those are the two genders. This week we're <laughs> reflecting on the Robo Debt Royal Commission with digital activist and campaigner Asha Wolf. Asha Wolf is joining us on the show. Yeah, it was a really good interview. I think uh, listeners will enjoy. I think you'll find it quite interesting and informative. Uh, thank you to our new patrons, by the way, Anton, Brett Lee, Adam, Lucy, Brayden, Zia, Laura, and Riley. Uh, we just released this week a special movie night movie review Patreon-only episode where we reviewed The Giants, which is a film about trees and also Bob Brown. But mainly trees. Uh, and, well, uh, I, more Bob Brown than the trees. I don't know. Anyway, Bob we Brown discuss, is a tree, as I, as we we discuss the confluence of trees and Bob Brown um, in this episode. If you're not already a patron or a Patreon subscriber, uh, the links are in. It's at seriousdangerpod.com is all the links. If you want to become one, it's only three bucks a month and helps pay Michael the Griff Griffin to produce the show. We rely on that to keep the show running and you get cool bonus contents. So why not? Remember to submit your questions too to hello mm. at seriousdangerpod.com. We want to do another Q&A. We've been asking for voice memos. If you want to record yourself saying something, we'd love to hear your little voices. Uh, <laughs> record a voice memo and email them through hello at seriousdangerpod.com. If you don't do a voice memo, fine. Uh, <laughs> you can just write your question and we'll answer it that way too. Fine. But that's how we're going to be answering it. Slightly disappointed and annoyed. <laughs> um, I didn't see you last weekend, Tom, at the at the conference. Um, where was I last weekend? Were you um, not, where were you sitting? Was it? I wasn't towards the. I wasn't back at the LNP or? conference in Queensland. No, I was doing literally there. anything else. <laughs> But it was such a blast, Tom. I mean, where else can you have 110 resolutions to discuss, including things like restoring the ABC to be a broadcaster of balance, integrity, trustworthiness, patriotism, colorblindness, oh, high moral standards, and yes. a supporter of faiths? Excellent. Hmm? Well, do you not bad. support this? I don't think I'd get a job back with them if, they, if those reforms were introduced. So I don't, I don't support that. That's that's the yeah. only um, LNP conference motion that I um, did not d- endorse. That's the only one. Oh, interesting. Okay, um, there was a little bit. I think that, like like Labor and unlike the Greens conferences, a lot more of it is open to media, and media can just go along and sit um, in these conferences. In fact, they're open to anyone, open to the public, so you can just go and uh, watch the LNP conferences. And oh, you don't have to be a member. No, wow. no, because I mean, I guess, and this is the thing, like journalists in the past have been like, when will the Greens be more transparent and allow uh, journalists to sit in on your conferences? And it's like, well, the difference is at Greens, state, like na- state or national conferences, we're actually making decisions for the party, whereas <laughs> the LNP and Labor ones are purely, polit- like it's purely just theatre where they allow the members to be like, please, we like these things. And then they're like, that's nice. Yes. Thank you. You're <laughs> smart. To know. You're strong. Yeah. yeah. But one of the discussions that was apparently held behind closed doors, there was a little bit of reporting on this, was uh, discussions around the treaty position. They were all very, uh, some of them were upset about the renaming or I guess returning the traditional place name of Fraser Island to Gari. Mm-hmm. Um and this is part of this discussion around the treaty position where they ultimately decided that they support a treaty, but <laughs> they ruled out as part of the treaty any compensation, yep. reparations, uh-huh. sovereignty, Good. or right of veto. Great. So 
any of the things that would actually really matter in a treaty. Fantastic. What would the treaty be then? Would it be a nice uh, Just a agreement? nice, nice, a nice idea. A handshake? And I think even like even within the LNP, there's people who are like, fuck no, no treaty. Uh, and I understand a lot of that is because they're like, well, we've never been at war. We've never been in war- at war in this country is what oh, David Little Proud said. you can't have said. a treaty between your own citizens. Oh. Yeah, the older citizens of Australia. Uh, Little Proud says, yeah, we've never, been, we've never been at war in this country, although he admits there were, quote, mistakes made Whoops. during settlement. Oh, no. I oh, tripped. did we accident? Oh, <laughs> oh, oopsie. I tripped and colonised your country. I had when I accidentally genocide. Oh, Lord. We all make mistakes, hey? You know, that doesn't mean we're a fucking treaty. <laughs> okay, but surely they're on board with trans rights, right? Surely. Uh, no, Tom, you'd oh. be right. Uh, other really important discussions uh, on the agenda of the LNP State Conference or Wait, was it the LNP? I guess it must be LNP State Conference because the LNP only exists in Queensland. Mm -hmm. Uh, To urgently review treatment of paediatric gender dysphoria. So specifically, they wanted all puberty blockers, hormone treatment and surgical intervention to be suspended for children under 18 until a review is completed. Just another reminder that like all puberty blockers do is literally just delaying the onset of puberty so that a child can, you know, look at what their gender is and figure that out and not then have to potentially go through, you know, a more invasive or a more difficult gender affirmation process later down the track. But anyway, it's all just fucking culture war bullshit. Mm -hmm. Great. (sighs) Um, Other motions include, I know they, they passed a motion against comprehensive consent education in Queensland schools, so that's really good. Uh, Really good to know. Uh, They want a public deck debt clock. They want to transition to nuclear fusion generation. Dutton was out there spruiking all the places that they're going to build nuclear and um, at least they, they want to get off coal. So, you know, some progress there. They're saying we've got to get off coal That's onto something. nuclear. Was he uh, listing wanna- places in Queensland? <laughs> I don't know. Actually, I didn't actually watch the interview, right. but presumably, I don't know, maybe he wants to turn some of the, the coal-fired generators in Queensland into It's going to be ones. on Fraser Island. That's what we're going to yeah. fucking call it too. Fraser Island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, And they want a Royal Commission into the COVID-19 pandemic to measure the impact of lockdowns to public health, the economy and children's education. Mm. Um, Maybe a nod to that kind of anti, that COVID sceptic slice of the the LNP and their supporters, but they give some with one hand and they take away with the other (laughs) because they bumped anti-vax Senator Gerard Rennick off the Senate ticket. At that state conference, he is now below that crucial, like that third spot that, you know, means he effectively has no chance of getting back in. Very sad for Mr. Rennick. That is sad. He is absolutely out of his mind. Although I do remember (laughs) that he, a few years ago, he was like railing against superannuation and calling it a neoliberal reform. Like there was this moment where he just produced this letter that was kind of based (laughs) just around (laughs) the super issue was like Keating was an arsehole. We should have a public option. This is a neoliberal bullshit that sold working people down the river. He was a neoliberal? Like what? Totally. In the Liberal National Party. I don't know. That is so bizarre. Very interesting. Peter Dutton was very sad to see Senator Rennick go. He said it was a, quote, tough day out for him, quote, your significant contribution, particularly to the taxation debate, which not all of us fully appreciate or understand because (laughs) the depth of your understanding and experience you have is quite exceptional, he said. I love Peter Dutton being like, I don't understand taxes. I feel like you do. And uh, sad to see you go. I don't understand don't what wait. you're saying or what you're fighting for, but your contribution <laughs> yes. has been amazing. It's been yes. so good. Oh. But probably, you know, the most important part of the LNP conference was dedicated to a screed delivered by Brisbane Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner about the destructive Labor Greens alliance that we face if they get their way mm-hmm. next year at the council elections. Our Labor opposition is incapable of forming a majority in their own right. Anyone who understands the numbers, anyone who's looked at the pendulum, will see that Labor's only path to victory in City Hall is by forming a destructive alliance with the Greens political party. 
we have, we found because these things are open, we've got a recording of this speech and there are just too many truly fantastic parts to muse upon. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, yeah, here's, here's a little summary of what the Greens are all about. Now, let me be clear, the Greens are the most destructive and divisive political force in Australian politics today. They are the ultimate fraudsters, the ultimate con artists. They are peddling snake oil to voters. Uh, wow. he, he goes on to he goes on to list like some of the policies you know what the greens actually stand for um including defunding I, my favorite part is he says defunding the police during a crime wave and there's cries of shame shame Sorry. during a crime wave I didn't know that the LNP did the shame thing. You shame. Know? I guess we're not we're not so different after all. They're also they also go oh, shame shame. <laughs> You know, a lot of talk about opposing new housing by blocking property development, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I've got the same talking points as Labor, apparently. They advocate illegal squatting as some kind of solution to homelessness. They advocate illegal squatting. This is because Jono Sri Ranganathan at, at one point was posting like, hey, there's all these empty homes across Brisbane. Like it would be interesting to kind of see them on a map if anyone was interested, mm-hmm. just interesting. Um, they advocate. Uh, they think shoplifting is okay. Again, Jono once posted saying, hey, like people shoplift because they're poor and it's that's kind of just a fact of life that's going to happen if they're poor and it's really not the worst thing in the world. Jesus. They want to reduce the speed limit to 30. <laughs> I like he says. They genuinely hate motorists. <laughs> <laughs> which is quite funny. Uh, they support Extinction Rebellion. Uh, he was talking about the Southern, uh, the Southern State Council is apparently reducing the red Bid, bin libit like bin collection frequency. Right. He spent quite some time on that. Um, really bad, I guess. They don't know how to just not put your meat in the bin or something. I don't know. Uh, they want to drive up rates and taxes. Blah blah blah. He, the the effect, like the overall message being, you know, that he says they're not just about trees and koalas or something. They don't even talk about the environment. They're super dangerous and. What is interesting in this speech is he's like the major parties have spent too long focusing on fighting each other. Right. And they should have been fighting the Greens. And he's- This election will be the first major election where we'll be shining a bright spotlight on the Greens. So, um. Oh, God. He means the local, the local council elections next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Goodness gracious. I, th- I love this, like, oh, the Greens aren't even about the environment or there's a secret <laughs> agenda behind the Greens. But of course, when you do talk about the environment, then that's all we talk about and we're post-material, we mm. don't care about real issues. And then, of course, mm-hmm. when you say anything about economic injustice, they go, oh, you don't, you don't even care about the environment anymore. Good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was also, yes, the other bit that in the speech that got a big reaction was when he mentioned uh, that Jonathan Sri Ranganathan is running unopposed in the, the pre-selection for Lord Mayor. Obviously, as a Queensland Greens member, I can't speak to that beyond what's been publicly reported, mm-hmm. um, but somehow that, that was leaked. And, yeah, when he said, you know... Me, Jonathan Shree. I know you laughed. Right now, there's a pre-selection underway in the Greens party with Jonathan Shree up as their Lord Mayoral candidate. Oh. Hey, these are people like Jonathan Sri Ranganathan, and then you can hear people ooh, ooh, in the background. And he's like, "No, no, it's true. You know, he's he could be the Lord Mayor. We're gonna have a Greens deputy mayor, a Greens mayor. Um, terrifying stuff. Who knows? Maybe we'll see it happen." Always a wonderful sign of your positive agenda that you have to make people's lives better when your entire speech is about your opponent potentially running against you. <laughs> potentially Always. running, that's right. Very good sign. Yeah. If you care about your future and you care about our generation's future, be a part of the change and join the Young LNP today. Join the Young LNP today. Join the Young LNP. Join the Young LNP today. Well, before we jump into uh, our guest and chatting about RoboDebt with Asher Wolf, one or two other little things jumped out at us. Uh, of course, LLP conference carrying on um, brilliantly. We are recording this before the fatted by election, which mm. is this weekend. It seems very boring to me. Uh, the yeah, coalition is really does. Hey, to it. I guess Stuart Roberts gone. That's a good news story. We can all enjoy that. Sure. It's yeah. Fantastic. Speaking of RoboDebt. Yeah. In Tasmania, Cassie O'Connor, leader of the Tasmanian Greens, has announced mm. that she is stepping down as leader. She's going to be running in the upper house. 
She was first elected to the parliament in 2008, became leader in 2015. So there's, there'll be a recount to have someone take over her seat in Clark. And mm-hmm. then, uh, yes, she'll be running in the upper house in the future. Rosalie Woodruff will be acting as leader of the Tasmanian Greens in the interim. Okay. I watched the press conference footage and at the start she's walking towards the cameras with Rosalie Woodruff and they're holding hands and I <laughs> I, I was like, oh, that's her partner. And then they arrived like, no, no, this is another MP. She's, I believe Cassie is Nick McKim's partner or they're in a relationship or at least have been in yeah, the past. They, yeah, they are, I'm pretty yes. sure. Yes. And Although, look, anyone yeah. could be partners with anyone, but I just, I just couldn't. That is incredible. <laughs> so I'm gonna sweet. need I'm gonna need like Albanese and Plibersek <laughs> fronting press conferences holding hands now. Adam <laughs> Adam and Marine holding hands at the presser. <laughs> Pretty sweet. But there we go. Look, I don't know enough about Tasmanian Greens politics. I think there's a bunch of stuff that Cassie O'Connor's done, which is cool. She's been a pretty fierce advocate for trans rights. I think that's certainly true. When it comes Mm. to China, we might have some disagreements. Yeah, she's got some some weird takes, hey? Weird takes on the old China. Mm. And finally, speaking of Marine Faruqi, I don't know if she's holding hands with anyone, but a bit of a hatchet (laughs) job on her this week, a story about um, a Greens MP having the goal to according to news.com.au, Greens MP Marine Fruki bulldoze native trees in $1.5 million subdivision of Port Macquarie property. Mm. Okay. So what's actually happening here? Do we know? Well, I'm sure that what is actually happening is not in news.com.au, but according <laughs> to this, it says that she's planning to bulldoze dozens of trees in order to subdivide her Port Macquarie investment property into three luxury rentals. Deputy Greens leader Maureen Fruki submitted a development application to Port Macquarie Hastings Council in January to knock down the existing four-bedroom home and replace it with three new dwellings at an estimated cost of nearly $1.5 million. The Adelaide Advertiser has this story for some fucking reason. Hmm. So. I understand that the party itself is saying that this is not true and this is being misrepresented. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yes. They have said that, although I have to say, like, I haven't seen the proper explanation for what those three dwellings are and whether she's just planning to then sell this property, um, which, you know, I wouldn't mind, Maureen, because it's kind of embarrassing that you own so many properties. (laughs) Could you please sell them to someone who needs them? Uh, How many does she own? Four still? I think one of those is like... A really small, like it's like a lot in Pakistan. Oh, okay, One right. Be- oh, like four properties all up. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, is that right? That sounds right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, yes, I don't know what's happening, or, but the Greens have said that like the, you know, the line that's been taken with this article is a baseless attack full of fabrication. Um, it's an urban house block. It was her family home before she moved to Sydney. It's in full compliance with ecological requirements and local government regulation. I will say- being like it's fully compliant, it's compliant with local government regulation when the entire Greens, you know, line is that those regulations are broken and yes. inadequate. I don't think that really helps. But they say if it goes ahead, there'll be no habitat loss. Um, they're going to retain the large spotted gum under which koalas cats have been found. Right. They're going to build nesting boxes. They say the suggestion these will be luxury homes is preposterous and complete fiction. Which I guess is true. So are they saying it's going to cost $1.5 million to do this? I guess so, yes. You probably can't get luxury homes for $1.5 million these days because I don't know about Well, indeed, what is, what is luxury? But look, mm-hmm. I think, again, we, I, I know I want to minimise, as everyone mentioned, as we've said on the show multiple times before, the fact that we have Greens MPs with multiple <laughs> properties that are effectively landlords is annoying and awkward <laughs> and unfortunate and it would be good yeah. if that was not the case. But I, I think it's interesting to point out this constant, this hypocrisy charge that we receive all the time. Mm. Of course, the right wing Sky News, I was watching, we're having an absolute field day with this story and the Greens don't believe in anything, yada, yada, yada. Of course, them throwing out all their principles about private property and like you should be able to dictate whatever you want to do over your own private property as soon as a Greens MP does it. But it, it just it just never works and you could never win. Okay. So obviously yeah. if you if you if the only way to prove that you are genuine about your care of the environment is to live in a, I don't know, a houseboat, um, as soon as you do that, you are not taken seriously, as John always regularly dismisses mm. as a crazy hippie. Greta Thunberg doesn't fly anymore. She takes a boat. Oh look at this weirdo on a boat. So it, <laughs> these these accusations are just never um, sincere. Or, Sensing or a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> they, they so you can get on a boat, you're a weirdo. All right. <laughs> Across the board. <laughs> look at me because I'm sailing on a boat. But, I mean, again, it's it's and it's a lesson for us on the left too because we obviously will point out um, individuals, what they mm. say publicly and their hypocrisy, yada, 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 and it's good fun. Often it's, it's fodder for good comedy. 
but of course that's sort of just as neoliberal as the rest of the bullshit society, right? Like, like but, limiting your critique to the individual actions yeah. of certain oh, people yeah. is is almost gonna always blow back on you, right? This is where also it's like there's a difference. It's a different kind of critique in terms of you know, quote unquote, hypocrisy. To be like, so you fight for in every facet of your life, like you support this particular policy change. Yep. Um, and that might materially disadvantage you right. and that makes you a hypocrite. It's like, no, that doesn't make you a hypocrite if you're still fighting for the same thing. I think a lot of the time, you know, I would hope that the hypocrisy that we would call out is saying that you support a particular outcome mm. and then acting in direct contradiction to that, you know, to that supposed value that yes. you hold. Yes. Sorry. Yes. That's a very good point too. The The fact that the difference between a Greens MP being a landlord and a Labor MP being a landlord is the mm. Greens are fighting for legislative change that would, yes, materially yeah. uh, go against their material class interests as landlords. That's important yeah. to point out. Um and of course, in this in the Sky News discussion, they were like, "Oh, I, I hear that the Greens want a rent freeze. I wonder if Maureen Faruqi is freezing the rent on all their properties." The other thing here is that the Greens have been banging on about the housing crisis and demanding that landlords freeze rents. Well, I'd be interested to know if the senators <laughs> are like, "Well, yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah, she is." <laughs> and Nick McKim has also explained that he's freezing the rent of all his tenants. Again, it's awkward, and it's sort of like this weird middle ground that you yeah. need to argue. It's it would be much better if they were. All renters. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, God. But you shouldn't be a I landlord, guess, but yes. anyway. You know, don't, don't take these hypocrisy charges too seriously would be my, my general mm. advice. Yeah. A Current Affair, January 3rd, 2017. It's clearly wrong, and the thing is, if a human being looked at it, they would instantly know it's wrong. We have complete confidence in the system. It's our new welfare crackdown. We will find you, we will track you down, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. But it's already showing cracks. We need to pause the system right now. We need to pause this until it's resolved. The Prime Minister needs to step in and pause it. It's called the Automated Debt Recovery System, brought in by Centrelink to help recover millions in unnecessary welfare payments. But now some people are starting to question their debt notices, saying they've been incorrectly targeted. The system itself seems to be flawed. The computer program seems to be flawed. It's working off an algorithm that's just not correct and not how Centrelink is designed. Michael Griffin received a debt notice for more than $3,000 from Centrelink just before Christmas and immediately knew something wasn't right. The website said to me, did you make uh, $26,000 in the financial year ending 2013? And I checked my records and I said that is correct. But that's how the problem started. Michael only worked for nine months of the year. For the other three, he claimed the New Start allowance. The new debt recovery system looked at his wage and then divided it per fortnight for the whole year, making it look like he earned $1,000 every fortnight while still claiming Centrelink. I was out of work and then I got back on work. And that's how it should be, surely. As for Michael Griffin, he's just hoping he can clear his name. The system is set up currently that it assumes guilt. We need to pause the system until we can resolve it. And the government needs to just not be afraid to lose any skin here. RoboDebt continued for two years and 11 months. All right. On Friday last week, the RoboDebt Royal Commission handed down its final 990-page report, for God's sakes. I have not read it They couldn't it have gone the full thousand? It's a bit weak. <laughs> Just treat yourself. <laughs> Crack the- I think with references at the end it was a thousand. I think I heard okay. Rick Morton saying it was actually a thousand. So. so killing a lot of trees, but doing important work. This week we were trying to get our heads around exactly what the report means, what the commission has found, whether justice is going to be delivered for this heinous and cruel shit show that was the RoboDebt scandal. Is Scott Morrison going to Azkaban? These are the questions we've been asking. <laughs> Just before we introduce our guest, very briefly, I thought I'd give a really quick recap over what the fuck this thing was. RoboDebt was an automated welfare debt recovery system. It was conceived under the Abbott government back in 2014, implemented under the Turnbull and Morrison governments between 2015 and 2019. And it used this very dodgy system of income averaging to raise debts to try and claw back money from uh, welfare recipients. It would end up sending false debt notices to more than 440,000 welfare recipients, raising more than 700 million bucks. 
Many of these debts were extremely large. They came out of nowhere. They had to be paid in a very short period of time. They caused massive distress on recipients uh, and their lives. Um, and in some extreme cases, some people were driven to suicide because of these notices. It was an absolute shit show. The coalition government had received legal advice in 2014 that there was no legal basis to do any of this shit. And the scheme was eventually found by the federal court to be unlawful. It was supposed to be a $1.7 billion savings measure, but in 2021, the government ended up settling a $1.8 billion class action lawsuit. And amazingly, it appears to be nobody's fault whatsoever, which is a little bit weird. Uh, Labor ran on establishing a Royal Commission into the Robert scandal uh, in the 2022 election. They won, and then in August of last year, they announced it. And now we've got the final report. So with us, uh, we have Asha Wolf, who's a grassroots campaigner fighting for welfare and digital rights, one of the founders of the Not My Debt campaign that really um, kicked off a lot of the, the pushback, the fight back against robo-debt. Um, thank you so much for, for coming to join us, Asha. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for being here. I guess, yeah, first up, what, what's been your personal response to the, the findings of the Royal Commission? It's finally here and handed down. Have you had a chance to go through much of the 1,000 pages in detail or how are you feeling about the whole thing? Yeah, so I have been reading through it. Um, it is exhausting, to be honest, because honestly so much of what we knew is already in there mm. and we've still got so much further to go in terms of justice and outcomes that give some sense of reparation for people. Yeah, I feel exhausted by it, to be honest, and I also am really aware that we're not done yet. We're only starting. So in the last week there was a, a panel with the Automated um, Decision-Making Centre for Excellence and it was looking at the NDIS and the lessons from RoboDebt for the NDIS in the future. Um, pretty much everywhere automated systems touch people's lives in governance. We're now looking at, you know, what we've learned from RoboDebt and what the impact will be on people's lives in the future. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, just just like uh, some bigger picture stuff, again, I've not read the, the report itself, but I'm reading media reports summarising exactly what the Commission found. Broadly speaking, the Royal Commissioner, Catherine Holmes SC, concluded that the Coalition's robo-debt scheme was illegal, unfair, cruel, failed to achieve its goals, and was a result of the DHS misleading both the Department of Social Services and Cabinet and Scott Morrison allowing Cabinet to be misled as to the legal status of the scheme. There were I, oh, yeah. sorry. I, I mean, I, not to, to jump in, but it's interesting the thing about failing to achieve its goals because I think um, you could dispute what the goals <laughs> were and whether it achieved them, couldn't you? Were the goals good? Yeah, question mark. I well, mean, which, yeah. Which kind of comes through in the recommendations, right? Like they, there are 57 recommendations including, this is from the Guardian, a summary here, included that a body should be set up to monitor automatic decision-making processes, that Services Australia should establish a debt recovery management policy, that the government should review the structure of the social services portfolio and the status of Services Australia and changes to the Freedom of Information Act so that we can get info better when, when cabinet document, documents are involved. There's some other recommendations we'll get, get to in a sec, but I suppose... Yes, the recommendation is, hey, we're still going to do debt recovery. Debt recovery management is important, but we just got to do it in a better way. Is that kind of a disappointing finding from you, Asha? Or is that how you read that Royal Commission finding when it comes to the approach to actually just trying to claw back some of this money that welfare cheats are stealing from the taxpayer? One of the things you have to understand about me is I'm quite possibly an undiagnosed type 2 autistic um, person who gets fixated on an issue. And when I go back and look at robo-debt, most people would look at the system and go, this is fucked up, but I'm not going to fight it personally because why would I put myself out there? Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to get steamrolled um, by the government, by the court system, and many people did. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the people who became involved in the campaign, they're the sort of people who are a little bit obsessive. And so if you look at... Kay, who was one of the people that was involved in the Not My Debt campaign in giving policy advice to people. She has literally spoken with thousands of people over the last few years. Am I disappointed? I think I'm just, my heart is shredded by what's happened over the last few years. And I look at what we're walking into in the future and knowing that nothing's changed, that mm -hmm. we're dealing with web systems 
that there's no safeguards in place, that civil society is more, less funded than it ever was, that people are more interested in their ego and and their self-interest when it comes to campaigning than outcomes most of the time. For me, what did I want? I mean, I wanted, of, of course, I wanted the Marxist paradise. I want all debts <laughs> gone. I want, like, I want, you know, people on welfare, on disability payments to be fully funded in a way that's well above the poverty line. I want, I want all the good things for people and I'm aware that that may make me a, a socialist sewer rat to some degrees, but <laughs> it, uh, it's where I am. And, um, you know, you'll ask an economist, did the findings go far enough? And they'll, you know, give you a measured answer. Well, I want everything. I want it all. I want, mm-hmm. I want reparations for people. I want, you know, people got back $100 on average, less than $100 on average for half of the people who are in the class action. And it's just not acceptable. Like these are people who went without food, who considered suicide, sorry, trigger warning, people who had marriages break down, who had relationships break down, who lost their houses over RoboDebt, who had their credit ratings impaired. And we've gone, oh, yeah, we've done the RoboDebt Royal Commission and it's all over now. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Don't fuck that shit. Like, honestly, it makes me really angry that mm. that that's where we're at right now, that, that all I stand up and say is that the Cronulla Sharks are thinking about revoking... Scott Morrison's number one ticket holder status. Like, no. I fuck, saw that. No. Yeah, like, that, like, that's the best we can get. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, that's, I, I feel as though, yeah, you have a very different perspective on this, perhaps, because you have been there from the start. You come at this from this p- perspective of a grassroots you know, activist campaigner, like alongside, you know, people like Lindsay Jackson and, and Justin Warren and uh, thousands of, of people who were involved in this broader campaign, their your Twitter account, you know, has been kind of compared to in 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 the scheme of, of robo debt compared to what journalist Andy Carbon's Twitter account was in the, the Arab Spring. You've really been on the front lines of this fight, but that's that yeah. fight is almost so so ironically it's been separated from this process that's meant to you know resolve robo debt and tie a nice bow on it like you people like you have really been i guess excluded from this nice happy resolution excluded from the narrative um and I, I know you've spoken a little bit about that kind of co-opting of what is really a grassroots led movement. And so I guess it's no surprise to me that you're like, okay, well, this thing that the media and political class have quote unquote achieved doesn't really mean that much to me because my fight is kind of different to theirs. I, I want to see the rate raised for job seeker and DSP and for um, sole parenting payments, single parenting payments. I want to, you know, the things that they're interested in in talking about, like, you know, how do we centre stakeholders? Like, you fucking talk to people. Like, come and talk to me. Come and talk to Lindsay Jackson. Come and talk to mm. people who are actually on welfare, the people in AUW, people in um, the APC, um, the people who are actually experiencing it. I think something that gets lost in a lot of this is the experience is very different to what I experienced, to what, you know, lawyers and journalists for experience because you know they have to journalists have to look for clicks they have to look for a story that will sell and so there was this Mm -hmm. lull between 2000 late 2017 early 2019 in the campaign um not in the campaign but in the media coverage sorry because they thought well it's not going anywhere so we should stop covering these issues and people were still coming up with you know thousands and thousands of robo-debt related stories, they just stop covering it because they're like, well, we're stuck in this place and unless something happens, then it's not a story for us. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people like Naus who were amazing in covering the beat on robo-debt at Guardian quietly got shuffled off that beat or, you know, and I don't know if that was by choice or if that was a choice by the Guardian to do that, but it was disappointing to us because he was fabulous on that, uh, on the story. Mm-hmm. But also that, like, we literally did EOS, Victorian Legal Aid. So we directed every single person who had a robo-debt towards Victorian Legal Aid because we knew until they took a case, robo-debt would not stop. And we also knew that Economic Justice Australia was getting a quarter of a million dollars a year from DSS. And I think 
before RoboDebt was declared unlawful, they briefly mentioned the word, you know, um, OCI, um, so talking about, you know, online compliance initiatives maybe three or four times. So when we talk about civil society, I don't really think of academia, of traditional mainstream journalism, of um, the lawyer class as part of civil society for the most part because they have to be brought kicking and screaming and dragged behind us to the table to get anything done because we don't have power quite often within the court system. We don't have the money to represent ourselves. And those who do are so tentative and, you know, in doing so, you know, they're waiting for the right case that it can take years. You look at Vic Legal Aid, it took till 2019 for them to end up in the high court. Mm. It's years, years and years of, you know, it was eight days after the first time when we occupied Alan Tudge's office that there was a, sorry, trigger warning again, um, suicide. There was a, a suicide related to RoboDebt. And, mm. you know, and this was already months after we knew about RoboDebt, that we were aware that it was happening. And I just think there is a level of complicitness of a certain class of the establishment who tut tut and actually do fucking nothing at all. Mm-hmm. Just some other um, summarised recommendations here. I'd be interested in your thoughts on Asha. The report also recommended that Services Australia should design policies with an emphasis on recipients, which also shouldn't reinforce feelings of stigma associated with government support. The consideration should be given to the vulnerabilities of recipients who could be affected by compliance programs and that a new legal framework is needed for the use of automation in government services with a clear Mm -hmm. path for review by those affected by related decisions. So I suppose the counter-argument would say, well, there does seem to be in this report some level of a shifting of reconsideration of the punitive welfare state that we have and uh, that we've established in this country um, over decades and decades of uh, dull bludger bashing and such. I don't know. Do you do you see that much hope there for a, a turning around of that shift and a reimagining of how the welfare system works thanks to this report? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask. <laughs> Well, I mean, look, uh, RoboDebt, it was a top-down implementation of faulty automation with a neoliberal managerial class pushing it like an unlubed dildo up the ass of the working class. And, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, but it's an awful situation that we dealt with for years and years and continue to deal with. People are still getting debts and, you know, and meanwhile, politicians and lawyers are out there going, we solved it, we're fucking heroes. And I just, I honestly want to puke because it's not over. Like Mm. if you look at, you know, how they talked about flagging vulnerability, how do you identify somebody who's vulnerable? Well, they have to flag Mm. themselves. How does somebody who's vulnerable, who has trouble with communication issues or who has trouble with um, sensory issues, flag themselves as vulnerable? Well, they have to have an an advocate who's who's there. Well, that already says to me, well, there's a whole group of people who are going to miss out on being flagged as vulnerable. So let's say you actually do get flagged as vulnerable in the system and your robot gets paused for three months. What happens next? Three months in, they automated the unflagging of people's um, vulnerability markers on their of on their uh, and so three months. So you think you're okay? You're getting you know an advocate. You're finding resources, you've talked to Not My Date, you've talked to Vic Legal Aid, you're planning to contest it and the vulnerability marker falls off your account and suddenly the debt kicks in again and you start getting calls from probe from the debt collectors. Um, you know, Jane Hume's ex-husband was, I believe, the director of probe group, um, which is a lovely little... Tidbit. Yeah, it's just it's, it's <laughs> that, you know, of this <sighs> campaign, you know, it's it's really um, distasteful. even. Ellen Tudge, his media assistant who set out the idea that, you know, we should go after people's personal data and we should release it to the media, mm-hmm. uh, Rachel Miller. So she was yeah. ripped like, legal with her legal case, completely separate to RoboDebt, which Gordon Legal then went on and repped the class action for RoboDebt. And I'm just like, well, you couldn't even, like, you couldn't even separate the sheets, you know, where it was so close up against each other that there's a feeling that how on earth can we hope for justice in a world where 
the smallest amount of respect is never given to people and to, to due process. Mm. I was, yeah, I found this, I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't find it shocking, but it's one of those things that, you know, it exists, but it's always stark to see it there in black and white in a, you know, fucking Royal Commission finding um, that the, the commission specifically looked at the government's media strategy that they deployed to support this and just how explicitly it revolves around, yeah, like, you know, Dole bludger bashing. Um, uh, reading from from the commission's report in January 2017, Mr. Tudge's media advisor Rochelle Miller developed a media strategy with respect to the program. And included the use of a, quote, counter narrative in, quote, more friendly media, which focused on themes of cracking down on welfare cheats, restoring integrity to the welfare system and using cutting edge technology to ensure that the welfare system was sustainable. Mm. It involved placing media stories about, quote, legitimate debts that were being detected by the system, including real life case studies and placing media stories about convicted, quote, welfare fraudsters. And uh, yeah, like and this is I mean, it's it's so true like this. This whole media narrative that, you know, we're all well aware of, but I, I, I guess I have some hope that, you know, this whole process might cause people, might give people cause to think critically on that classic, a current affair story that's rolled out, you know, in, in the States as well as, as in, in Australia, um, about the, this idea that everyone on welfare is cheating the system or that this is a huge, massive problem um, and that they're all evil, lazy slobs when that's just not not the case and is just a part of this broader um, strategy to demonise welfare recipients um, and to kind of, you know, make being on welfare uh, and outside of the, the paid labour market as one of the most shameful and horrible and humiliating experiences that any human being can endure. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so um, the campaign against Robert Doe was really aware of that, of that stigma that was being used. One of the things that was really useful was working as a movement to um, vilify journalists essentially that <laughs> um, used the term doll bludger. So, mm. um, and we deprived them of sources. Um, I think when you look at um, coverage of trans issues in the media at the moment, Mm-hmm. It's really useful to use the same tactic. They don't get stories, you know. If if you're going to speak about people with trans misogyny, then then you're not entitled to hear our voices. You're not entitled to to know the inner workings of people's lives. And look, there was a sense of joy in in making things made out of journalists. Like people were angry, so and they were. This is going to sound awful. I took a lot of joy in setting loose people, like thousands of people, on journalists who. Would assholes and mm-hmm. um i'm glad i did not do it again you know if <laughs> journalists are going to As you people, yeah just um tell people to go after them you yeah. don't have to do it publicly you don't have to say even dox them but you can signal to the masses on you know <laughs> this is how we're going to talk exactly about them what, yeah that's exactly what they yeah. have been doing to welfare recipients mm. you know yeah doxing and setting the populace on them yep and the aps Came out with a letter three days ago, you know, saying, hey, we're going to investigate the APS and breaches of the code of conduct and here's the number for Lifeline. And it's awful, but I laughed because in 2016, 2017, that's what they did to RoboDebt recipients. They gave us the Lifeline number when, you know, people asked for help. Wow. And if you're an APS, a member of the APS that is struggling with your conscience today, I'm really sorry for you, but also good. You should, like you should, um, because people people died over over robot yeah. and lives can't be restored for what was done. And you know, while we should celebrate the whistleblowers who stood up and you know spoke out and who leaked or who gave disclosures in a timely way, there are also many, 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 many members of the public service and contractors who did nothing, who went along with it because. Um, you know, when ministers said jump, they said how high. They didn't say is this lawful, is this legal, mm-hmm. is this um, moral. They just said, yeah, sure, boss. And, you know, and that's not the purpose of the public service. The purpose of the public service is to serve the public. It's not to serve the minister or the government of the day. And really it's a breakdown in democracy um, that yeah. was through this this episode of, of what's happened with RoboDebt over the last few years. Yeah. Mm. Well, Catherine Campbell is probably the most uh, notable 
uh, person in that category. She was the Secretary of the Department of Human Services between 2011 and 2017, and the Royal Commission found that she kept the true nature of robo-debt secret when advising cabinets because she knew that Scott Morrison wanted to pursue the program. I think this is this is the, the crux. If people aren't across it, again, legal advice was given. This was not a legal scheme to do. There was no lawful basis to do this. And then mysteriously, uh, that advice disappears as certain ministers, particularly Scott Morrison and others, want to pursue it and say, yeah, I'm not so interested in that. Let's, let's just make our dreams come true, guys. Let's be proactive and do it. <laughs> Catherine Campbell sort of went along with that, and she has since been promoted to oversee the AUKUS deal. She's on a salary of about 900 grand a year. She was on leave when the commission report was being handed down. A lot of talk now about how this is tenable. How can you be responsible for robo debt, play a key role in this scheme, um, and be promoted to advise on nuclear shit? What do you think is going to happen to Miss Campbell? And uh, what we should, should we be calling for her to, to face the dock? What's her future? <laughs> She's currently on gardening duties on paid leave. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, she's just hiding. I can't, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm hesitant to speculate because there have been referrals to the the AF, AFP and to the mm. NAWC, uh, to the NAC. So and I'm cautious because I don't want to prejudice any outcomes. Um, while I'm really aware that people would love to know the full list and the, the names of the people, the ministers and the public servants that um, have now been referred for a potential prosecution, both civil and criminal, mm. um, I'm also aware that maybe sometimes, even though I'd love to go berserk and yell and scream about you know, the crimes that they've committed, maybe holding our gunpowder dry for a while until these issues have gone before the courts, maybe for the best. Um, mm, a more yeah. salacious sealed section than Dolly, some might say. <laughs> you mean hang on to that, eh? Yeah, you, Thank you. you yeah, that, that was waiting yeah. together. <laughs> we sort of, I mean, again, you're right, we shouldn't speculate, but I mean, there's been reporting around who it is and isn't in that section and um, people are sort of saying, oh, we think all the notices have gone out. I didn't get a notice. And I'm talking about Stuart Robert here, Alan Tudge. Morrison mm-hmm. just immediately rejecting any adverse findings about him within the report, saying, no, it's wrong. I didn't realise that you could do that. I thought the whole point of mm-hmm. Royal Commission is that we get a definitive <laughs> accounting of what fucking happened and that we all respected the outcome of those Royal Commissions. But no, that's not how things worse work and he's uh, apparently considering his legal options. But you've got to understand, court and legal is still looking at potential tort of malfeasance, right? So right. just because somebody hasn't received a referral doesn't mean that they won't end up back in court being sued because mm. they've committed acts of malfeasance in public public office. So mm. anyone going, yeah, I'm Scott Clear, and you know I'm all good, and you know I'm off to see. Was that an intentional like, pun? I uh, no, I'm just really <laughs> Scott, okay. Scott Free. <laughs> oh, <I'm so> sorry. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, like they should they should sit down and shut up maybe for a while, and mm. I don't know. Wise advice. The terrible thing about these kind of people who are involved in robo debt, not just the most senior people in the APS, but the little people who kind of scurry around and go, "Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm, no, of course I'll implement that policy," is they fall upwards because they're yes people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at the long history of public servants who have done terrible things over the years, they're still there. Um, they've, you know, proved their worth by knowing where the corpses are hidden. Know. They know where the bodies are buried. They know how to keep a secret and they're rewarded for it. And I, I hate to think it, but I think some of these people will be rewarded for fulfilling the purpose of RoboDebt, which was successfully harming hundreds of thousands of people. Mm. People say, oh, the purpose of RoboDebt was to recruit this or that or to automate a system to save us time or this or that. But Justin Warren, who's a technology consultant, he has a saying, which is the purposes of a system is what it does, and RoboDebt fucked people over it. That's mm. what it does. That was his purpose. Yeah, yeah. And some I've seen some, you know, Discord, like I think Tom Students and um, the Not My Dad account was, was tweeting about the impact of this on people who are now just like, after this experience, I am never going to try to seek support from the government ever again. And you can imagine the government being like, great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Good. Leave us alone. Mm. We, don't, we don't want to help you anyway. Yeah. I think RoboDebt was a um, program of social murder and, you know, 
people deciding as a result of the fear and humiliation and harm that was committed that they'll never ever get a payment ever again, um, that they'll never apply for any payments even if they're entitled to them, that they'd rather fucking die, you know. And there's there's harms that we don't even recognise that we don't even see yet because, you know, for the, the sole parent who decides, well, fuck it, I'm not going to take, you know, this payment, this small payment, let's say family tax benefit or whatever, but then they don't get the reminder when their kid goes to kindy that their kid needs vaccination because, you know, with family tax benefit, if your kid isn't vaccinated, you can't claim family tax benefit. So, you know, and then you have a situation where you have a cluster of children who aren't vaccinated who are going off to kindy who, you know, or they can't get access to kindy. So there are social harms that are caused by these sort of policies mm. and these outcomes where people are, are self-excluding from systems as a result of robo debt. Um, that we don't see yet and that we don't have ways to account for yet. Mm. Yeah, good point. I'd be interested to, to, to sort of go, we're going to start wrapping up here, Asha, but I'd be interested in your thoughts, in on the Labor Party and Bill Shorten's response. There, there seems to be a lot of contested history about the RoboDeck campaign and, who, you know, who deserves what and who's blood, what, how much blood is on how many people's hands, et cetera, et cetera. I suppose I'm just interested in, you know, in an honest way, if we account what what role the Labor Party has played in response to both, yes, creating up a punitive welfare system that sort of has led to the robo-debt world, but also, you know, can we honestly say that some figures and some labour policies have resulted in in securing some justice for robo-debt victims? Would that be fair to say? What's what's the accounting of labour's role in, in the robo-debt story, both good and bad? That's such a loaded question because you know that whatever I answer, I'm going to get three million trolls Partisan trolls <laughs> down my fucking throat at the end of the day. Um, that account again at Asha underscore Wolf. If you <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I think that both parties um, could have done more over the years to have built safeguards into legislation when it came to automation and data management and accountability measures. Mm. So, if you look back at 2010 where there's data matching for the purposes of, um, you know, for looking at tax purposes, um, you know, there weren't safeguards and accountability built in to the degree that I would have been happy with. Unfortunately, in 2010, I knew nothing about robo-debt or any of this stuff. But if you if you fast forward to, to now, 2023, we still don't have oversight on automation. but you know, we don't have accountability. And when you look at the the schemes that are there for compensation, they're incredibly hard for people to access. Most people don't know that they can apply for compensation directly to um, Services Australia. So, And that is something that I would encourage people to do, to check out their CDDA scheme and to go and have a chat to your local legal aid, whichever state you're in, if you're in Victoria, Vic Legal Aid, and, and consider putting in an application for compensation because of um, defect in the scheme mm. that you were subject to. Coming back to Labor, I applaud Labor for finally recognising that robo-debt is an issue in 2019 after robo-debt was declared unlawful. I think it's wonderful. I'm really grateful. We need all the allies that we can get. I think that it's wonderful that Shorten has decided this is an issue he cares about. I would love to work with him. I have previously offered to bring him on board, and I think that he has done a wonderful job in showing how much he can bandwagon an issue. Um, <laughs> I've taken so many fucking phone calls from people who are very, very, very upset about the out- outcome of the class action, mm. and I hope that Shorten recognises that process is injustice. So just because you run a class action that gives people $2 or $0.10 cents or a hundred bucks when they've, you know, on average lost two thousand dollars. That's not justice. Just because yeah. somebody plonks down a nine hundred page tome on a desk and says, "Here's the report," that's not justice. Justice is when people feel that what they lost and what was harm has been repaired, and that hasn't happened yet. Mm. And mm. I, I urge Shorten to talk to the actual victims and to spend time in considering the ways in which people can learn to trust government again. And it's not a top down process. You can't. You can't have a consensual relationship with automation or with government that says, hey, we're going to do this to you and you're going to like it. That's not how it works. 
Yeah, I mean, I just like all this, all the same bullshit comes out. I mean, people might not un- re- recognize that the compensation that any robo debt victim has received is, as you say, like these tiny amounts or restoring the money that they paid when they shouldn't have paid at all. No one's been given sort of money for the distress and the horrors of being a victim of this terrible scheme. The mm-hmm. Royal Commission did not recommend that a compensation scheme be put in place, but there was, you know, some suggestions like, hey, maybe. Any money that you would put into a compensation scheme should be used to lift these payments above the poverty line, or at least increase the kind of level the poverty payments that we talk about when it comes to um, Centrelink payments. And then Bill Shorten talking to the seven AM podcast from Schwartz Media this week was like, "Well, I think that what we've increased the rate will already be far greater than what I think the commissioner would have can imagine." Oh, well. <laughs> And also talked about the government has uh, significantly increased Commonwealth rent assistance. Oh my god! In the same god. conversation as saying welfare is a human right, he switches to no, this is as much money as we're prepared to commit, and uh, people continuing to live in poverty. These payments is just inevitable. We have no choice. Inflation, blah 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 blah. But anyway, I appreciate our observations. So I mean, you hear shit like that, and it becomes particularly discouraging. I think just the yeah. same it's bullshit being yeah. ruled out again. And it's still below the poverty line, right. you know? Yeah. Regardless of whether a commissioner tells you that you should raise raise the rate or whether, you know, whether you've already raised the rate last year, if the rate is still unlivable, that's not ethical. It's not moral. Like, pull your fucking head in. I know Shorten wants to be Prime Minister one day. He knows he wants to be Prime Minister. The left is never going to come on board with a guy who is just giving lip service to, to, to these sort of issues because at the end of the day, it's people who carry campaigns, you know, so mm. when I look at what, happened it was you know the victims of robo debt really who stood up um it was you know the unemployed the working class and it was people like diana amato and madeline masterson who challenged it in the courts who you know actually experienced these things and we have such a long way to go when it comes to finding a, a playing ground in politics where politicians actually hear the voice of the people and Frankly, they need to listen, otherwise they'll be carried to it kicking and screaming just like Morrison and um, Mm. Campbell will be. Yeah. Bloody oath. Um, thank you so much for talking to us about this, Asha. Thanks for all your work, uh, first of all, and yeah. for talking to us on Serious Danger. You, you, you're a socialist sewer rat. You're always welcome here on, uh, thank you. on yeah. Serious Danger. Social sewer rat paradise. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can people do? Where would you direct people if people listen to this or watching this on YouTube and they want to help out more as the fight for justice? and against a punitive welfare system continues, where should people um, go and put their energies and maybe a little bit of their money? Yeah, I would recommend the Australian Unemployed Workers Movement, um, Union, sorry, um, and also Not My Debt. Get on board, offer to volunteer, all of that. Offer money to all of them. Everybody <laughs> needs money. But, you know, definitely getting involved at also a local level. So looking at how the issues in, intersect with where you are at. So if you're a... As a single mum, you know, and you're affected by the cashless debit card or whatever is happening in your area, get local people together to talk about it. It will never not be powerful to meet with other people and see people in the flesh and spend time hanging out in pubs, getting absolutely sloshed and talking shit about how you'd like to burn stuff down, you know. <laughs> Yes. Well, we can put links to yeah AUWU and Not My Debt so people can support those movements um, in the show notes. But, yeah, thanks again for coming on, Asha. I know, like, even in my early days getting to understand Australian politics and being on Twitter, like, you have just been an ever-present force and you're fucking relentless and it works. And I think that the, you know, mentorship particularly that you have shown a lot of, of activists in 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 the space is really valuable. And I think that, yes, we, we have uh, you to thank for a lot of this alongside, you know, the, the hundreds of other people who fought for this, but yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I hope you get some rest. <laughs> I think you've been up since 5am. So, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Institute of Public Administration Australia Conference, September 2018, one year and two months before RoboDebt was stopped. So this uh, happened in 
early January of 2017. That's another lesson. Try not to roll things out in January uh, because there is not much other media going on and you find yourself uh, intent on that's the only headline in town. I kept thinking, where are those cricketers when you need them doing something <laughs> naughty? But they were well behaved that year and so we ran the media. Thank you, Asher Wolf. Just quickly, I know this is a very cheap point, but I just want to point out that um, Bill Shorten repeatedly this week was talking about how the robo-debt scheme was uh, was the coalition government gaslighting the nation. He said it so many times really? in every possible I didn't even hear that. media uh, opportunities that he had, gaslighting, gaslighting, gaslighting. And it was just funny because I remember That's... a certain YouTube commentator mm. saying that when Max Chandler-Mather said that the government was gaslighting the public. Labor are fucking gaslighting us. Yeah, that was... Yeah, that was so it evidence was really of immaturity. Distasteful. It was really yeah, just yeah. stupid and we're idiots yeah. and we're just like, we're woke, blue-haired, genderqueer Marxists who don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> so it's, it's just odd. As is Bill Shorten, apparently. <laughs> Welcome, comrade. <laughs> Good stuff. Unemployedworkersunion.com is the Australian Unemployed Workers Union website. Go support them. You know, we love them and um, they are heroes and have been fighting against the bullshit of robo-debt in the face of outrageous attacks from <laughs> YouTubers as well <laughs> uh, over the years. So good luck to them. Uh, another quick update too for Victorians. You might have heard the Save Rack Beacon public housing estate campaign has kicked up a notch. It is being occupied. Samantha Ratnam, the leader of Victorian Greens, was down there showing solidarity, as were lots of other people on, from across the left. Um, this is public housing estates that being that is being knocked down. The Andrews Labor government likes to talk a big game on public housing, but they're getting rid of it to re- replace it with not as good stuff and they're kicking people out. And so there's Margaret, particularly one resident who was occupying her house in Barrack Beacon Estate in Port Melbourne. Please support them if you can. We'll put the chuffed link uh, to raise money for that campaign. If you want to find out more, there's more information in the show notes too, to save Barrack Beacon. My cousin, Steve, is involved in this cool architectural Steve. non-profit <laughs> um, architectural outfit that basically does good things, uses architecture in public space <laughs> and for public housing. Well, people's good. He's not one of those evil architectures or developers. <laughs> so um, he's involved with that campaign too, so can endorse. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now, please. It helps get the word out. Um, also helps if you follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Serious Danger AU. Head on to the socials and look at the clips that we post and then get in the comments and look at the people calling us commies. Um, (laughs) We've had a few conservatives in the comments lately just simply commenting, you're poor, Um, and that's fun. So you can go go hang out with those guys if you like. Uh, It's it's a good chuckle. If you want to become a, if you want to support the show in more and help us pay Mike the Griff Griffin, keep the show going, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, SeriousDangerPod.com has all the info for that and the socials, etc. It's just three bucks a month and you get cool bonus content. And don't forget to send us your voice memo questions or your little boring text questions if you want. Email us hello at SeriousDangerPod.com. I think that's it. Keep hooning, everybody. We love you. Keep hooning. Hoon away. Bye. Skirt. Skirt, skirt. <laughs> Serious danger. But anyway, I appreciate our observations.